Hello everybody. Happy that you decided to join us today. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come to say thank you. Thank you for bringing us together again. Thank you for your word. We pray as always that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. And our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture continues to be John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which says, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And we continue our third declaration of freedom, freedom from discouragement, no frustration, which is found in Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 18 through 30. And again, today I'll read verses 23 through 25 out of the NIV version. And it says, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And so last time, we looked at uh, Webster for the definition of hope. And it told us that hope is a feeling of expectation and desiring a certain thing to happen. Our normal way to express hope is with an uncertainty. We spend a lot of time wishing and hoping that something for something to happen. Even when people try to ease our anxiety when making a promise to do this or that, uh, they try and ease our anxiety by saying, I swear. Uh, but we still find ourselves wishing and hoping that the promise will be kept. With the best of intentions, a promise is sometimes not kept. Things happen that are beyond the control of the one who made the promise. But God is not man. All of God's promises are yes in Christ Jesus. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verses 16 through 20, and this is the Living Bible version. It's lengthy. But it, gets, it, it makes my point uh, better than I'm making the point. For, starting with verse 16, it says, When a man takes an oath, he is calling upon someone greater than himself to force him to do what he has promised or to punish him if he later refuses to do it. The oath ends all arguments about it. God also bound himself with an oath so that those he promised to help would be perfectly sure and never need to wonder whether he might change his plans. He has given us both his promise and his oath, two things we can completely count on, for it is impossible for God to tell a lie. Now all those who flee, who flee to him to save them can take new courage when they hear such assurances from God. Now they can know without doubt that he will give them the salvation he has promised them. Verse 19, this certain hope of being saved is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls, 
connecting us with God himself behind the sacred curtain of heaven where Christ has gone ahead to plead for us from his position as our high priest with the honor and rank of Melchizedek. So many of God's promises do not depend on our character, but on his faithfulness. Think about Abraham. In spite of his failures and sins, God kept his promise. The thing about Abraham is that he believed God and God counted it as righteousness. We all know that his believing God did not mean that he was always morally right or even always spiritually right. But Abraham, Abraham's bent was toward the promises of God. His character and his will were expressions of his belief. When God called Abraham to leave his country and his family, Abraham packed up and left because he believed God promise. He believed the promise. Now, he took his nephew Lot with him, which is not what God told him to do. Uh, even though he deviated from the instructions, uh, his will was bent toward obeying God. He didn't take Lot with a, a, a hidden agenda. Uh, nor was he trying to sneak one on God. Abraham probably felt responsible for Lot since Lot's father had died. And if you read the story, when Terah, Abraham's father, moved from Ur to Canaan, he took with him Abraham, his wife, Sarah, and his grandson, Lot. So it is possible that Abraham never gave it a second thought. He was used to being, he was used to Lot being with him. Abraham left based on the character of his will and the promise of God. He believed God and he chose to obey God. God's promises are all yes in Christ Jesus. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Amen means so be it. The amen is spoken by us to the glory of God saying, I believe, I agree with God. So Abraham believed God and said amen to God's promise. As believers, we have more of God's promises. We have more promises from God than Abraham did. And we have the Holy Spirit on the inside. And he stirs us with the excitement of knowing God. And knowing that one day, the aches and the pains and the trials and the troubles associated with this body and this world will eventually end. And so we eagerly wait to see Jesus and receive our new bodies in a new world to live with Jesus forever and ever. We're waiting for the adoption, which is the redemption of our bodies when Christ returns. The adoption started uh, at conversion with the Holy Spirit. And it will be completed when we shall enter into the, when Jesus comes back, it will be completed and then we'll enter into our full inheritance. Even though God's promises are sure, they are not always immediate. So in the meantime, we wait and we hope. We, we are saved by that hope. Patience is required. And for most of us, therein lies the problem. Romans 8 and 25 says, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Now, 
In that, I see two problems that we must wrestle, wrestle with. First, hoping in God does not come naturally for us as humans. And second, patiently waiting is not our first emotion, especially in this 21st century where fortunes are made by folk who who have come up with ways for us not to have to wait. Think about it. We were fine with the oven until somebody invented the microwave and made the wait a whole lot shorter. We were okay with waiting until we got home to make phone calls until somebody shortened our wait by inventing the phone booth. And then somebody won up them by inventing the mobile phone. So hoping in God and waiting patiently is for us a source of tension and frustration that need not be. In Christ, as believers, we have freedom from discouragement. We have no reason to be frustrated, but we must work for it. We must desire it and we must seek after it. We've got to do something. It's like receiving a check. It's our funds and the funds are there, but we must endorse the check and present it for payment. If we don't do our part, then the check is just ink on paper. Abraham's story started with a command and a promise from God. He acted on the command and the promise was activated. Sometimes in order to not be discouraged or frustrated, we've got to speak to our souls, speak to ourselves, talk to ourselves. In the 42nd Psalms, the psalmist uh, if you should read it, I'm not going to read it, but you can read it at home. The psalmist is having an intense conversation with himself. For whatever reason, he seems to be away from Jerusalem and among non-believers. He sees a deer panting and struggling to reach water, and it reminded him of his thirst for the Lord. The psalmist consists, the psalm consists of the ups and downs of the psalmist. Uh, you can feel, when you read it, you can feel the deep despair that he's in. He says that his tears have been his food day and night while the people around him mock him. They know that he serves Jehovah, and yet he's an obvious mess. So, so they mock him, asking him, where is your God? Why won't he help you? The tension is, is, is that he too wonders the same thing. It's one thing for folk to be in your face about something that's not true, but it's a whole other situation when your inner being agrees with what they're saying. The psalmist says, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. He wanted to worship, but yet he couldn't go to the house of God in Jerusalem. Then in the midst of his discouragement, he starts to remember when. One of the, the keys to fighting discouragement and frustration is to remember. Remember when. You can fill in the blank. Remember when I used to, when, when things were great, when, when, when all was well with me, when, when, when I felt the presence of God. Remember when. And we can all remember when. We can all fill in the blanks. Right now, during this pandemic, called COVID-19. We, like the psalmist, can't get to our, work, to our house of worship. 
And, and for some, this is a cause of discouragement. It's a cause for frustration. The psalmist started to remember when. For him, it was the time that he was in worship, the time when he led the processional to the house of God. He remembered the shouts of joy and the thanksgiving. He remembered the praise and the worship that, was, that he so enjoyed. As the psalmist did, so must we. Preach to ourselves. Remember when. Or, or, or we can be easily discouraged. We can give way to discouragement. We don't have to wait to receive YouTube messages. We don't have to surf the web looking for an inspirational message. When the psalmist remembered, remembered when, then he worshiped where he was. Then he asked himself a couple of questions. He asked his soul, why are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Now, I know there are some folk who hold the position that, that it's insane to talk to yourself. But I say, at times, talking to yourself is the sanest thing that you can do. The psalmist doesn't just talk to himself. He goes deeper than that. He speaks to his soul. That's deep. When, when your tears have been your food, day and night, while all the time people are questioning your God. And, and, and you are starting to question as well. When you've been trying to do right to the best that you know, you, you've been praying and studying the scripture, you've been going to worship services, going to prayer services, going to Bible study, and yet, it seems that God has hidden his face from you. And one thing after another just keeps going wrong. And not just a little bit wrong, but cut to the core wrong. So much so that it's hard to tell day from night. That's a good time to have a talk with your soul. Why are you downcast, oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? After searching the soul and, and finding no reasonable answer, the psalmist responds to his own question. He is having a conversation with himself. Now, once again, I know that there's a folk that say it's all right to maybe talk to yourself as long as you don't answer yourself. To which I will say, as the old folk used to say, just keep living. You might do more than answer yourself. If you live long enough and the troubles and the trials and the tribulations come hard enough. So the psalmist, he says to his soul, put your hope in God for yet will I praise him, my Savior and my God. That's it. That's the answer to all of life's problems, all of life's dilemmas, all of life's questions. We may not know and may never know the why of our problems, but the answer is the same. Put your hope in God and praise him anyway. For the psalmist and for us, when it seems that our hopes have been shattered and our prayers are unanswered, when our enemies are in our ear and our feelings are more than we can handle, just know that God is still on the throne. And even if I don't feel it, God's presence is with me. And I can yet have joy, have the joy of worshiping him. 
then a renewed hope and a renewed patience comes in. Isaiah 40 chapter verse 31 says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And finally, Psalms 130 verse 3, the psalmist says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits and in his word, and in his words, I put my hope. That's all for now. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, thank you. Thank you for hope. Thank you for renewed strength. Thank you, Father, for your word. Show us what to do and what to do with it and give us the courage to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it for today. See you next week. Bye-bye.